Welcome to the Mission Driven Leader, presented by TaleoConnects.com, where we explore the new, unknown, and innovative themes for work and give people the ability to show up resilient every day. Here are your hosts, former Chief Knowledge Officer of NASA, Ed Hoffman, and partner and Vice President of Portfolio Management at Taleo, Laurel Sim. Well, welcome back, Ed, to the Mission Leader podcast. Uh, I'm excited to talk to our guest today, and I'm really excited about our topic. It's about bullshit. I mean, I, 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 can't, I can't fathom how people survive in the world of bullshit that we deal with uh, today, especially all of the political plays that go on. And how do we know when somebody's being authentic and real with us? Um, it just, it absolutely, uh, it's a bit mind boggling at times what, what we're dealing with and, and what our future leaders are gonna be dealing with and how much bullshit they're bringing to the table because they think it's the right thing to do. It's, it's baffling well, to me, Ed. I gotta, first of all, I love working this with you because you, you bring in cool people. And uh, I'm, as, as everyone knows now, I'm a big hockey fan. And uh, so I'm looking forward to that. And since we have Jason, who's going to be joining us shortly, I had to pay homage to the Edmonton Oilers teams who, for one year, came to New York and helped the Rangers win a Stanley Cup in 1984. Got the cup, got the whole thing there, and uh, and I'm good. I'm also amazed of working with you, uh, Laurel, that uh, I can't imagine of any other podcast that really would talk about bullshit. I thought you were kidding, but obviously you're starting that way, so... Uh, but I have to also say, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and so you end up with a doctorate in bullshit if you grew up in New York. So there, there's a lot of positives to it. I, uh, I, I'm happy that you're not offended by, by bullshit. Um, Please, are you kidding me? That's, yeah, I'm, I think I'm exhausted I got into, by bullshit. But. I think I got into Columbia University uh, and probably NASA because of the skill to kind of share positively the bullshit. The ability to oh, talk, the ability to, to connect with people, the ability to go into any area. Uh, so you're a Poe bullshitter. You're like a provocative bullshitter. Is that is that how I should take that? Jason probably doesn't know this, but I nicknamed Laurel Poe because there's a great there was a great creativity uh, author, uh, Edward de Bono. And one of the things I learned studying from him was Poe, which stands for provocation. You want to provoke. It means creativity, new ideas, stimulation. And when I think of Laurel, that's one of the things. So I think you're post Sam, and now you're throwing it back on me. But yeah, I think you're right. I think, you know, there's a positive aspect of bullshit. If you use it in the standpoint of having a conversation, wanting to talk, you know, one of the things I loved about hockey, I said that was my favorite sport. When I was a kid growing up in Brooklyn, you listened to everything on the radio. Because there wasn't a there, there wasn't all the the ubiquitous sports all over the place, so you try to get the channels from New York around, really around the the you know the country and the United States. And one year the Rangers needed to get a, a certain they had needed to get a certain number of points, and they needed I think Chicago to 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 beat Montreal or something like that by seven goals, and I had to get a station in Chicago. But I would talk to our friends, and part of it was the the ability to bullshit about ideas, possibilities, and not be overly serious, right? So I think there is a positive aspect to what we're talking about today. Yeah, I think I think we just got to figure out how to use bullshit for good, not evil, Ed, because the right. evil side is awful, um, and it and it really actually is is unhealthy for for people in in trying just to be productive in their work days um which is why i i asked jason if he would be open to having this conversation with us not because he's a bullshitter but because jason uh jason has a show on tsn and he's focused on trying to bring out the truth allow people to think about concepts and, and look at things in, in light of, of what he's learned from the knowledge that he's gotten. And, and, and at times I wonder where, where he, he has to dismantle the bullshit in order to figure it out. So at this time, I'd like to introduce our, our guest, Jason Greger. He uh, has a show on TSN, and uh, he's been a lifelong uh, friend of mine. So I take great pride in, in what he's accomplished. Jason. 
Welcome How are to you? the show. Oh, Good. thanks for having me. Appreciate it being here. Absolutely. So Jason, um, when, when I first told you about the concept of us talking about bullshit, what came to mind for you? Yeah. Well, really the last few years in the world, I think it's become a, you know, a bigger issue. You, you see it, uh, um, online now there, there's lots of bots that, uh, that can be created and, you know, people just want to create fake. It, it obviously didn't help when the, the former president of the U S um, you know, was fake news and, and, you know, he's a, he's basically a pathological liar. Like he's been proven and caught in lie after lie after lie. And the problem is we have we have too many people and I don't really care if you're if you lean right or left. It's irrelevant to me. But you should hold the part like if people actually held the party they voted for as accountable as they critique the other party, we'd be much better. But people are like, well, I voted Republican, so whatever the Republican guy says is fine for me. And if I voted uh, in Canada NDP, well, then whatever they do, it's never wrong. And that's the problem with society now is, is we accept the bullshit and we accept the lies because it's like, well, that's what I voted for. That's the way I lean. And we, we become way too bipartisan. And I think it's a real issue in, in society and in the world. And, and if you look at what's going on with Russia and Ukraine, yeah. Vladimir Putin showed the world who he was for decades. And as the great uh, late Maya Angelou once said, when someone shows you who they are, believe it. And, and it's only now they're like, geez, I can't believe he's doing this. Well, no, he's, he's shown you this since 2014, his disdain for that. And he, you know, he, he's convinced a lot of people and, and sucked them into it. And I think sometimes in North America, we don't really know how to deal with it because, you know, sure, we have left and right. But at the end of the day, there, there's nothing nearly as bad. Like we have racism, of course, and that's awful. Don't get me wrong. But um, we, we don't have a society that's controlled directly like Russia is by Putin. And it's but the bullshit starts now when you have Russian bots and, and they want to create divisiveness amongst people. And that's become a big issue in society. Absolutely. Ed, when you were back in NASA, there, there was a lot of um, approaches to how you guys would work together I as thought, a team. Yeah. And, I thought you were yeah. going to oh. say there was a lot of bullshit, and I was wondering where you were going to go with that. But, no, uh, I, w I didn't work for NASA. <laughs> I mean, I work for myself. I, yeah, yeah. I bring in my own bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was just going to say that, 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 that it's all about the team dynamics. And, and how did the bullshit factor play in there? Or were you able to remove it? And if so, yeah, what, look, what kind um, of approaches did you take? So, so I define these things. What Jason's saying is totally right, is that one of the things I'd always say to the NASA folks, uh, I was responsible for the development of individuals, the teams. How do you work together as a team? And then organizational learning, right? Those, those kind of things. And the one thing I believe is that teams are effective if they have a common mission, a goal that they connect to together. And I'd make this, this the, the advantage, I think, of sports, and NASA had some of that, is you have a clear mission. If you're a hockey team, your mission is to win the Stanley Cup, right? And if there are things happening that are keeping you from doing that, whatever it is, then you have to address it. And so it minimizes what we're discussing here is the, the bullshit factor in that you can see the score, you can see the results, you know how you're doing, and you're looking to do things that lead to the performance. And NASA had that advantage. If you're working a mission, if you're working a project, uh, if it's going well, you can see it in the costing, in the time frame, in the, in the progress. And if it's not going right, and if it goes to, towards failure, you end up on the, the front of a newspaper and you can't hide it. So I think there's an advantage of non-political you know, kind of work where you can see the results. Be, you can just see honestly what's happening. So to a certain extent, I think that it minimized what we're discussing here as the bullshit factor. You, you can't lie and get away with it. You know, when, uh, when you have a Columbia Space Shuttle disaster, you're going to find out why it happened, right? You, you're going to find out that you know, things weren't done, done the certain way. So I think, um, so I think that's one of the things that minimizes the politicalization of things is when performance matters. But I also go through periods where performance doesn't matter and then you don't need, you don't need talent, you don't need expertise, you don't need learning because then people are playing games. So I, I don't know if I answered your question, but you, you, hit a, you hit a buzz point, you know, with me is that 
if you're in a business that demands outcomes, performance, you know the difference between those who are winning, being successful, and you know when it's not. And politics too often nowadays doesn't have that uh, equation at, at, at all. You can fail, you can do things wrong, and you can fool your people that it's okay because it's us and it's us against them. So, so yeah, and you did answer my question, so thank okay. you for that, Ed. So when, when we look at that, that thought, um, Jason, from, from Ed, and we think about the world of which you live, um, and you're a public figure, so you, you're constantly, you know, you're very passionate about your politics and, and about what's happening in society, of which I truly value, because you also work really hard to, to keep your community um, strong at home. Um, but, but when we look at what you do on a daily basis, the information, the data that comes in, what tools do you personally use to dismantle misinformation? What um, behaviors do you exhibit in order to make sure that when you're having those conversations um, with your colleagues and with your, your viewers, that, that you feel really good about the fake news or the bad data and that you can, you can show up a little bit higher and a little bit better than, than those that are creating the, the noise? Well, I do a lot of my own research and, and research when it comes to sports is obviously a lot different than scientific research, right? Uh, if you're going to be a scientist, then you, you've got to be there doing it. Um, for me, you know, there, there's lots of different available um, statistical stuff that you can look at. Uh, you know, I could watch, you know, videos, you know, I record every game and then I watch it back. And so, if, you know, if there's because in now sports narratives are very different. They're, they're not life changing. So I want to make that abundantly clear. Um, you know, sports is like the sandbox of life. And so, you know, if someone has an opinion that they don't like a defenseman, that's fine. At the end of the day, you know, some people in Edmonton, they don't like Darnell Nurse. It doesn't matter what he does. They're not going to like Darnell Nurse. Now, I can give them information when they claim, well, he doesn't do this, he doesn't do this, he doesn't do this. Well, it's very easy to come up with statistical data to say, well, actually, over the last three years, this is where he ranks in even strength goals, and this is where he ranks in even strength ice time. And you can break it down to, to different levels and different situations, penalty kill, five on five, and all that stuff. Um, I do think in sports a lot, there's there's false narratives that are pushed too often that, that really aren't true. And so now, again, they're not life changing, but at times they become annoying because it's like, well, this is people, people hear something once and, and usually a lot of it stretches to negativity. If a team is losing, they want to find a scapegoat. They want to, this is why they're losing. And then they'll repeat it and, oh, it's this guy's fault or, oh, it's the coach's fault or, or it's the GM's fault. And, and sometimes it might be their fault, but it's rarely just one individual's fault. Uh, you know, it could be a part of a system. It could be part of the team. And then there's always stuff that even I, who's my job, I don't know everything because I'm not in the room, right? So you don't know if, you know, uh, the second line centerman and the first defenseman hate each other. Like they, something might have happened and that causes people not to play to their best because they've got issues or somebody has their own personal issues at home. But for me in, in my world, I'm a big believer in let's, if we're going to have a debate, then to me, your, your, your opinion and sometimes too often in life now, people confuse opinion with fact. They're very different. Your opinion to, I learned this a long time ago, your opinion only matters to the point that you can defend it. So if you can keep defending your opinion with valid points, great. But if you're just like, I don't like this guy, why? Well, because. Well, that's, then your opinion doesn't become as relevant to me. So I'm a big believer and I love to have debates. I'll have debates because that's where you can learn. But too many people want to confuse fact with opinion in, in sports. And, and, uh, and, and again, it's not that concerning because it's not real life. Right. Um, you know, when people start having opinion and facts when it comes to, um, you know, politics, which has policy and, and actually impacts how we live on a day to day basis. Well, that's very different. But in the sports world, it is still to me when I do my own research, it's a lot of hours of, of studying data. And I like to come up with my own stuff that other people don't have and then try to put forth different information. So to me, if if I can have somebody every day feel like they learned one thing, then I've done my job and my show. They're like, oh, right. now it might be as simple as, hey, I didn't know that uh, you know Leon Drysaddle under Jay Woodcroft hasn't been on the ice for a goal against, right? Pretty big deal in ten games. So you know, small little details like that that only take a few minutes of research to find. I think there's. I gotta follow up because I follow sports very closely. Uh, I grew up in the New York area, so I mentioned Rangers. My teams tend to lose. Uh, the Knicks in basketball, uh, the Jets in football, and the Mets in basketball. So I'm one of those guys. I watch the uh, – so I follow uh, Facebook uh, sports. I follow Twitter. And 
what surprises me, it feels like society has gotten even more negative in sports. So that um, it is hard to be a coach. You come into a team, you lose three games, and there seems to be people who want to see the losing. They want to be angry at someone else. There's this sense of us and, and them that I didn't remember so much years ago. And so I'm wondering, is it is this something that you see uh, as a uh, as someone who does you know programs? Uh, you have uh, you know a, a sports program. Uh, do you see the sense of those who love you because they're part of your family, and those who are just negative and and want to see maybe Edmonton lose? They want to complain maybe about something. I guess is what I'm saying. Or, well, yeah, there know. there is definitely a there, there's a small percentage of people that I find right. aren't happy unless they're complaining, and that's yeah. You know what? They, they might not be happy in their real life, so this allows them to, to lash out in sports, which is, is something. It, you know, for some people, what, what social media has done for some people is give them a voice when they feel like they're voiceless in every other aspect of life. You know, maybe they're at a job that they're not satisfied with. You know, so we can we'd have to look into the psychology of, of, of the human and really know them. And so. Um, the reason you never saw that stuff beforehand is because it wasn't available. There wasn't social media. That's social true. media, for the most yeah. part, can be fairly negative if you choose to let it. And I always tell people that. Um, the best decision I made a few months ago was I blocked these three people on on Twitter. These three, they were just constant. They were fueling negativity. And because if they commented on one of my posts, everybody else saw it. So finally, I just said, I'm enough. And I blocked them. And my entire experience has changed. Now, not, not that I ever really cared about it too much, but just after a while, it's like, oh, I don't need to see it. Like, I don't know you as a human being. And too many people feel that it's their right. Like, if you want to express your opinion, great. I don't have to listen to it. I don't have to care about your opinion, right? Uh, um, the, to me, you look at the, the taking uh, criticism from someone that you would never ask for advice is probably not the best way to live. You you know, when somebody that I care about is somebody that I respect, you know, critique something or I'll be like, hey, I'll probably pay more attention to some, you know, nameless, faceless person online. And, I, and I, I've never understood why people think that, um, you know, their opinion to, to talk about something that they really don't know about should, like, right. I would never express my opinion on NASA. I don't know anything about NASA. Like, I've, I've watched a, a, a shuttle launch. That's about the extent of my NASA experience. So I would ask you your opinion, but I would never express a really strong opinion on something because I don't know anything about it, right? Now, if people, people are passionate you. about sports, so they should have an opinion. But to me, we, we need informed opinions more than uninformed opinions. I think that's the the bottom line. I, I think it's also my my sense is in your business you're you're about the art of conversation, in that you want sports should be fun, it should be something that you enjoy. It's entertaining, and it's entertaining when you can talk to others. You can have a conversation that's positive, and I think, you know, maybe that's the the thing that 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 connects there. But the other thing that you're saying that I resonate with, on project teams, on NASA teams. You can get that individual, those individuals who are just negative, uh, where if you let them stay, it will start taking down the team. Uh, and on rare occasions, I had that at NASA. I had a couple of people who they showed up at a course that we were doing. It was a one-week course. It was a residential. Everything was bad. The leadership was bad. The president was bad. This was before Trump. Uh, you know, the world was bad. And I, I basically sat down and said, you need to go back to your organization. This is, you're polluting the whole learning experience. And so I think uh, that that's where it takes a team into a direction where it's not a conversation. It's not even an opinion. It's the notion of people who want other things that are going on to be negative. And I think that's maybe, you know, kind of what you're saying. And uh, I was gonna follow up with you if I can ask you a question is, what makes you, what do you think is the skill in the work that you do around creating that conversation, creating people who want to be a part of something. Is there something that made you, in terms of your background, your experience, your learning, very good at what you do? Um, that's a good question. I would say, well, I have a natural curiosity. I like to I like to f learn new things. And that probably came from my mother. She's highly intellectual. My, my mom got her doctorate when, you know, after my father passed away, she was in her mm. 60s when she got her doctorate. And she's wow. been, a, she's one of the smartest people I've ever met in my life. Like she's read, no joke, probably close to 20,000 books. She's an author now herself. Mm. And so as, as a child growing up, like, 
you know, I started, I read the paper way back in the 80s when it was a paper at home. And, you know, we read the paper. My brother and I used to fight to get the sports section first. So then when the other guy had it, you'd wait and, you know, you'd read the other parts of it. And so I think I had a natural curiosity for learning that, that came from my mother. And um, so that's part of it. Uh, the other one is, I, I think t to have a good conversation, you need to listen. I, I think one of my best skills on my show is I like to interview people. I like to, to learn about different walks of life. Uh, you know, sometimes if you can learn the serious stuff about the X and O's of hockey, but more so the journey of where they came from and what they've learned, I, I find that's, that's interesting. Um, and I think if, if you can, if you can have people listen to a topic that they're not interested in, because I, you know, I, I can't just talk hockey every day. I'll go crazy. So, you know, we talk football, we talk auto racing. We have, so I have different guests from different sports and, and you have to find a connection where the person who might not be a fan of that sport or even that individual will end up listening to the interview because it's something that they find interesting or at least educational. Um, now, there's days, of course, as a radio host where um, if everybody likes your show, you don't have a good show. That's the number one thing. So I, I think not everybody has to like you. You have to get over that as a host. Not everyone's going to agree with your opinion. That's totally fine. Um, and uh, Ron Durda, one of my instructors, that was something he taught me. I always remembered when I went to school over 20 years ago is if you're doing a show and everyone likes you, then you're not doing it right. Because you want people to listen and there's got to be some conflict sometime. And, and there's times when me and my host off air, well, okay, we're going to talk about this topic and I have to take a side that I don't really agree with in real life. But for radio, it makes it more entertaining to have a disagreement and say, well, actually, I like this defense. But now, now you have to come up with some valid points. I don't just, I can't make up something to it. But um, so there is part of the entertainment factor that also goes into it where you, you have to look at the other side because there are people out there that will actually agree with that side. So, you know, and that's a way to engage your audience is you want to try to present both sides. And like in any conversation, I find too often now people, even in their, in their relationships at home, if you're listening to your friend and they're telling you their side of the story, let's just say, for instance, in their relationship at home, well, I'm only hearing their side. I'm not hearing their spouse's side. So I don't know, even if they're, and they're one of my best friends, how true it really is, or that's their interpretation. And so I think we always have to be leery of to not, you know, sometimes there I'll just listen. Yeah. Okay. But I don't really express an opinion because I'm like, well, this is their interpretation of it. And what about the other side's interpretation? Because sometimes I think how we interpret things, we truly believe something and we interpret it, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm interpreting the same way that Laurel's interpreting. And even though it might be true, we can still interpret something completely different. Well, well, I think on average, Jason, you and I interpret most things differently because um, you're a boy and I'm a girl. Yeah, well, you're wrong and I'm right, so that's fair. <laughs> wow. He's a boy and you're um, a girl. Jason, that's, I learned it's something just as new. simple as that. Every it's time I work with you. literally as simple as that, yeah. Ed. Um, I, this is actually a good time for us to go to commercial. Um, when we come back, Jason, a really important question Ed asks, has for you is, what your favorite winter sport is because his is making snow angels. So when we get back, we'll have to figure out what yours is. We'll get back to the rest of the episode in just a moment. But first, a word from our presenting sponsor, TaleoConnects.com. As a manager, you know how important it is to solve issues right the first time. If you don't, you risk wasting precious time, money, and resources on things that could make the problem even worse. That is why at Taleo, we start by getting to the root cause of your specific problem so that together, we can implement the solution that gets you the results you are looking for the first time. Taleo's unique approach to management consulting and resourcing is focused on building a community of experts that work together to help clients solve complex problems and find success in their businesses. We work collaboratively with you to implement the solution that will solve the root cause of your problem, not just the symptoms of that problem. From management consulting and project management to staff augmentation and resource recruitment, Taleo's trusted team can help you take your organization to the next level. If you're interested in learning more about how Taleo can help you overcome your organization's obstacles and take your business to the next level, visit TaleoConnects.com today. Okay, welcome back. Thanks, everyone. Um, Jason, I, I suspect that you have a favorite winter sport that is not snow angels. What might that be? Whew. Well, pro I guess, you know, probably hockey. It's, you know, I, I'm coaching, I coach my son in, in U9 this year. I've coached him for a few years. It's, you know, I, I, my job covers it. I love playing it. 
Um, you know, even shinny now. So yeah, it would probably be hockey, but I have picked up cross country skiing. I'm not very good at it. It's a really good workout and it's a good challenge. So that might be second right now. Oh, nice. Good for you. Congratulations on that. Well, not really. Um, Thankfully, there's no videos of it. So, (laughs) well, maybe that's what we'll have to go source out to, to figure out if it's bullshit or not. Um, speaking of bullshit earlier in, in, in the episode, you were talking about how it's, you know, you're talking about sports and it's different than real life. Um, I actually disagree with you almost completely. And the reason, the reason for that is, is that everything that you talked about, I experience every day in work, the false narratives, the, the trying to create emotional attachment to things that probably shouldn't be there. All of those things happen every day in my work day. And and that's the bullshit that I continually try to break down. And I use data points like you use, but I also use just good common practice of tell me more why you think that. And I try to break it down that way. And, and so I, I, I'm really curious um, about, about how you show up to make sure that you also don't contribute to the bullshit that might be going around of those types of conversations. Because for me, at times I get in, ingrained in so much of the crap that, that I almost think, whoa, did, did I just contribute to the bullshit? I think I did. So I don't know. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question because, you, you know, I think you have to be self-aware, but sometimes when you believe in something, you might uh, inadvertently, you know, be piling on to the bullshit because someone will strongly disagree with that. And so even if what you're presenting is factual and accurate, the other person listening can interpret it as bullshit because they don't believe in that. Like there, there are some s- so strong belief systems um, in real life on political spectrums, but then in sports, like if somebody doesn't like, and I, you know, I'll use Darnell Nurse. He's a he's a hot topic defenseman in Edmonton. Some people, it doesn't matter how well he plays, they only will watch the game for the mistakes. And trust me, every player makes mistakes. So Darnell Nurse in a game, let's say he misses a pass, or so he'll miss a pass. It ends up going for nice. He could complete nine passes in a row after that, but the person will only focus on the one that they did that he didn't make because that's what they want to see. Right. And so it's really hard. So for me, I I watch a game and then I always watch it again the next day in the morning on my show. I can fast forward and get it done an hour because I like to rewatch it to ensure that, okay, what I thought the first time is that actually what happened. And in some cases it isn't because, you know, in, in real time you see something, then you're like, well, was it that bad of a play? Was it that weak of a goal? Was it a bad decision? And sometimes, you know what? Hey, that puck bounced. That wasn't a bad pass. That's just kind of unlucky in sports. And so when I say that sports is different than real life, because you don't get to really go back and rewind things in, in real life like that. It's, it's happened. It's occurred. And in sports, it's only impacting the game. But if Darnell Nurse misses a pass, that doesn't impact anything in society. It really, that impacts him maybe and his team's ability to win or lose a game. So that's what I said by it's different because, you know, when you and your job, if you're having to dissect bullshit because someone's lying, but that's impacting you every day. And so if Darnell Nurse misses a pass, as a fan, they have a choice to allow it to impact them or not. But it doesn't have to, right? So that's where I, I think that sports is, sports is something that people love. They're extremely passionate about it. For a lot of people, it's a release. It's their a way to get away from the real world. And I totally respect that. I love it because that's, uh, you know, like you see it in sporting events. It's one of the rare places where strangers will high five people when their team wins a big game. Like, when, do you ever see people in a movie theater high five each other? Do you ever see people at a concert high? Like, where does it happen? It doesn't happen. You don't see people down the street if I'm out for dinner and I'm, oh my God, I just had this new filet mignon that I've never had before. I'm going to high five the table beside <laughs> me. It doesn't happen, right? So sports can r- really unite people and bring them together in ways that, that evokes emotion that a lot of people don't. And I love the passion part of it. And so I guess that's what I was saying where it's different. But for me, yeah. I'm always trying to ensure that, okay, if I see, like, you know, did I see something? Did I see it right? And, you know, there's, there's lots of different people that I respect who all go read their opinion because they, they will have a different viewpoint than me. And there's a few people that I follow purposely on social media who, who watch the game different than I do because it forces me to be like, hmm, maybe that's right. I know I have to watch it from that side. Otherwise, you can get down our rabbit holes where, you know, people get in their echo chambers and they only want to follow or listen to people that agree with them. 
Well, that's boring and, 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 and that's where you get in trouble because you get your, your blinders on and you're only seeing and hearing and you're, you're getting to hear the same information over and over again and you believe it. Like if you're a, if you're a right leaning person and you only watch right leaning media, guess what? You're only getting what you want to hear and v vice versa. If you're a left leaning person, then you only listen to the left side. Well, you're not making any better. I'm, I'm pretty much central. I don't, I don't think I'm right or left. I can lean right to center on some things and I'll lean left to center on others, but I think I'm pretty much a centrist. The problem is we don't have a centrist party. So I'm caught in no man's land right now and it sucks. All right. All right. Well, you can't be nowadays. In, in times of great ideological disagreement, if you're in the center, no one likes you, except other center people. I mean, I I, I consider I think myself. More, as, I think the va I think the majority of people though are in the center spectrum, and some will lean slight yeah. right, and some will lean slight left. And the problem is, we give a voice to the extreme rights and left far too often. And if we totally and if agree. we would stop focusing on them, we would be much better. I totally agree. You should run for president. <laughs> or uh, no, I, I don't think I have. Well, you know, talking about bullshit, people don't. The other thing is, I think deep down, yeah. people want to hear the truth at the end of the day. But how it's presented now is we've got too much of a separation that if you tell the truth, then the media outlet who leans left or right, if it doesn't agree with their viewpoints, they'll they'll find holes in it that aren't even factual. And they'll do it. And, and I think That's we need right. more honesty in, in, in everyday world, but definitely when it, when it comes to politics. And the problem is now we, we have, and, and where that honesty has to come from is the voters, because if you vote conservative or if you vote uh, liberal, or I don't care what side you vote on, but ask the party that you voted for to have standards and uphold them. And we don't do that anymore. And that's the bullshit that I think is the biggest problem, Laurel, in society right now is, is the bullshit from with own party. Like we accept the bullshit of the party we vote for because we voted for them. That's the most inane way of thinking that I can imagine. I'm just, I can't get on board with that. Yeah. It's actually one of the top things that, um, that where organizations fail is on accountability and responsibility and making sure that those are accountable are following through for those that are responsible for getting the job done. And it actually, it's, 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 it's an underlying failure of every organization that you look at that wasn't able to come out of the curve of a poor recession or, or solve their problems through the pandemic um, or, or, the, or the changing of a government. They fundamentally couldn't get there because they couldn't hold themselves accountable and then deliver against that on what they, they knew they had to do. Yeah, and then the other thing I think is too often we don't realize how much sometimes luck plays a part in our success. And rather than get so high about our own success to say, you know what, hey, I was lucky that I met this person at this time in my life. And it doesn't mean you didn't work hard. You still have to work extremely hard to be successful, but there's still some luck. And when it comes down to sports, it's interesting to talk to Rob Volman, who's, who's widely considered one of the, the really good, arguably one of the best analytics guys out there. Now he works for Los Angeles Kings. Had him on my show many years ago, and he talked about analytics tracking in, in sports and in hockey. And really, you can only track accurately, according to Rob, about 60%. And the other 40% of the game is just sheer luck because it's an inadvertent bounce that goes off a skate from the corner into the back of the net. Like, you know, the, for a hockey guy, the infamous Steve Smith goal, right? Shoots it from behind his net, off Grant Fuhrer's leg, it goes in. Calgary wins the series. Edmonton's chance of five in a row ends, right? On that one play. Now, some would say, well, there was lots of other plays leading up to it. Sure. But were any more vital than that? And that's just an unlucky bounce or a lucky bounce if you're on the Calgary side. And that happens in sports all the time, right? Like you can go back and, and look at deflections in football that went off somebody's hands. You know, the, the Tyrese catch for the Giants. That's considered one of the greatest catches of all time, Ed, yeah. right? And, you know, right. could he do that again? Like, could Eli Manning scramble out of the pocket right. and, and get away from, from that much pressure? Like, no offense to Eli, but he was not a scrambling quarterback. That's arguably no. the greatest scrambling play of his life, and it just happened to be coincided with the greatest catch of Kyrie, Tyree's life, and they win a championship because of it. So And, and go I, I back think, further. Go back further. Uh, that the two giant Super Bowls most recently, their teams were, I think, nine and seven. Yep. And they got into the playoff run years where that that got you in there. There have been teams that go ten and six or eleven five yep. that don't make it. So totally. there's, so there's, there's always there's a little bit factors. of factors. Right. Absolutely. And so even even in our life when we look sometimes where like if I look at my own personal life, you know, I got lucky 
in, in a sense of I got introduced to someone that opened a door for, for my company now, and it's a company that not many people do. I own my own radio show, like I buy my airtime off the station, and no one really does that. And I didn't even know that was an option had I not met John Short, right? So if I don't meet John Short, well, then I'm not in the situation I'm in 20 years later. Like there's, there's, you still have to do the work to have success there, but if I had met him, that opportunity would never have arose. And the biggest source of luck I see over to go is your net, is who you know. I mean, uh, I have to tell you, since I've done this, I get so many letters from people know saying, how did you get lucky enough to connect with Laurel? And, uh, you know, I just say, <laughs> I highly doubt that. Ed. You know, sometimes <laughs> it just just works in your in your your favor. I do have I, I don't know if you have I have a, a burning question for you, Jason. So I don't know if now is a good time or did you want to Let's go? Let's make it happen. So really, I've spent my life around learning. How do you get individuals in teams to work together. That's fundamentally what I did at NASA. And I think I had a sense of what led to that, even with the luck and all these other factors. You've, you're in the sports world. You were Edmonton Oil is always a, uh, a solid organization. What, in your experience, leads to certain organizations, certain teams, being a part of a winning situation? Not necessarily winning the whole thing, but there are certain, you know, certain organizations there are certain teams that seem to be associated with figuring out how to be successful and do you well, i can tell you, you have, the, the, you've watched the, that the, the orders were great in the 90s but it's uh it's been pretty slim yeah. picking since right so they, they were kind of the poster boy for non-success right they, it was called the decade of darkness in edmonton because they just couldn't get out of their own way and I, i'm a big believer that when I look at the successful teams in different sports, now obviously you need great players. There's no question. At the end of the day, the teams who win have great players. But when you look at the situation where how one change at the top, I, I still think it's a pyramid of leadership and it starts here and then it trickles down at every level. And if you look at a simple thing like the the Chicago Blackhawks, who were a bad organization under uh, um, you know Mr. Wirtz, and then his son takes over, he changes everything. All of a sudden, they're putting the games back on TV. The fans are coming back, and they drafted. Now they got some luck. They won the draft lottery the year they got Patrick Kane. Huge luck, right? Um, they were able to draft Jonathan Taves third overall after Pittsburgh took Jordan Stahl, which helped Pittsburgh because they won, but it really helped Chicago. And but they had made some good picks before that, and Keith and Seabrook, you know, Keith, the second round pick that pans out. But after many years of, of sucking, they just got new ownership and leadership. They brought in, um, you know, the proper GM and, and and the right players, and it works. And you know, you look at even you know Pittsburgh. They changed. They they fire their coach one year at the end. He comes in. He has a different message. And now they still had Crosby, so that helps. And I think if you look across the board of successful teams, consistency and transparency usually and honesty, especially for highly driven competitive athletes, everyone that I've interviewed and talked to over the years, they want a coach who doesn't bullshit them. Right. Tell me the truth. This is how I view you. I think you're going to be a third line center. You're going to play defensive roles. Then it's up to the player to decide either I choose that role or I'm not going to be happy. And, and successful, I think even owners who find that uh, they hire the right general manager who hires the right scouts and they have a really unified situation like the San Jose Sharks under Doug Wilson. Now they never won a championship, but since Doug Wilson took over that team, they had for over 19 years, they had the most wins in the National Hockey League in the regular season and the second most in the playoffs. And they only went to the Stanley Cup final once, right? But they had second and third round appearances consistently. Now they didn't win, but that's not the, the GM's job. Once the playoffs start, there's nothing he can do. He builds the team. And then some years, you know, they got unlucky. Some years it's injury. Some years they, some of their best players didn't perform as well as they could. And, and I'm not sure how you can ever really hope for that because the giants are a prime example of eli manning in the regular season was basically he won half his games in his career won half his games but he won two super bowls they got lucky for three games at the right time of the year they played well so luck has a part in it they played well is another part of it then there's on the opposite side like bill belichick and tom brady they built and bill belichick you look at him i think what you can learn from bill belichick was now, sure, he had Brady and he had a great player to, to orchestrate things, but Bill Belichick removed emotion from his decisions. And I think that's the hardest thing for any of us to do. He would let go of veterans who had done a lot for him because he felt like, you know what, we can replace him with somebody cheaper that helps build our salary cap and we have better depth all around the team. And so you still need the foundation of a great player. And then you had a great coach. But Belichick, I, I found, was, was unique in the sense that he didn't let motion 
rule his choices. And that's probably the hardest thing to do in life because we're all emotional beings. Yeah. And so, you know, things I've learned from talking, and I've been blessed to talk to so many different coaches, and I find in different sports, like sometimes in football, some will say you need more of an emotional leader because it's such a physical sport sometimes. At the end of the day, it just comes down to, are you willing to outmuscle the other guy to get that extra yard to get a first down? Whereas in hockey, it's not like that. And baseball, it's definitely not like that. So you need more of a tactician who can rely on stats and then have a good gut feel. So there's there's never one right way to do it. But the, the one thing I found was strong leadership to empower the people usually leads to the most success. Yeah, I, I, I think, uh, I mean, that's my experience at NASA and from, from the things I've researched at organizations. If you have an effective leadership and all the things that means, you're gonna be successful. Uh, we do know if you have a bad leadership, you're, you're doomed. Uh, that sense of a vision, you know, you talk about ownership that has a sense of what they want to accomplish, that gets you closer there. And, uh, you know, that the, the importance of people, respecting people, getting the voice of, of, of the team and giving, you know, giving them a sense that they have the responsibility for how they move forward. I think those factors are so important. Yeah, like they talked about Brady and, and I know opposing fan bases didn't like him, but you talk to the teammates who played with him. Tom Brady made mm-hmm. the guy whose only job was it to run downfield five times a game on the punt cover team said, hey, dude, like this is your job. It's super important. And and even if you make the, you know, the, I'm not going to say the, the, the least important player on the team, but in essence, they kind of work because they, they're only on the field for a total of maybe 45 seconds. But if you make that guy feel like his job is just as important as Tom Brady's job, now you got a better chance of success. And so leadership to me, but the other thing is, it can also be simple as somebody ensuring that their organization take care of the player's spouses. So they understand when's right. their birthday, when's their anniversary, how are their kids, what are they like? And so now the spouse is like, wow, I'm happy because my spouse is happy. So there's not conflict at home because if there's not conflict at home, you can be more productive in your day-to-day life. And so good organizations look just past beyond their employees, what their role is in work and they try to if they have time to figure out well how can I make their whole life better because if that person's happy and comfortable in their life their chances of having success in their job is much higher I and and I would agree that that one one thing that you said on the earlier part that I just want to reflect on as we're coming to the end of this session is is the taking the bullshit out of the conversations Jason like it is so important as the leader, as the person that's rallying the troops, whatever troop you're looking at, is get rid of the bullshit and just call a spade a spade because they're going to figure it out or they're going to be able to see through you. The trust is gone. The respect is limited. Um, and without those two things, why are you even showing up every day? It's, it becomes embarrassing. Like I do believe, like especially in sports, and I, I think in a lot of places in life though, but definitely highly motivated people are highly competitive and if you tell them the truth, even if they don't like it, they'll respect it. And I think we've got to the point where you can't improve. If you try to impress everyone, you end up impressing no one, right? Because yeah. you're not authentic. And so that's a different definition of bullshit. But you're bang on, Laurel, is that you just, you just have to be honest with people and say, you know what? This is what I think you're capable of. Now, you might believe you're capable of more. And that's awesome. But for the time being, this is what you're going to be on our team and our group. And that's the great thing in sports is you can be a third line player on a team, you win. And you know what? If, if you gave it a free agent in two years and you want to go somewhere where you can be a top six forward, well, now you have the right and you have the opportunity. And so, but guess what? You might never be as good as you think you are. And, I, and it's funny, I've talked to a lot of athletes over the years who found that their hardest thing was, because a lot of them, they're all the best athletes on their team growing up, right? They're all the best. Now you get to the NHL. Well, you're not all the best. You're not all Connor McDavid. It's just a fact. So it's hard to rewire yourself to suddenly be like, man, you know what? I'm going to be a penalty killer and I'm going to be a, a, a checker. I'm not going to get the, uh, the, the accolades of scoring 40 goals like I did in, in junior or in minor hockey and being the best guy anymore. And some players can accept that and some can't. And I think that's where good leaders find ways to, to help convince the player that this is a good thing for them and it's going to help them. And those who don't, you know what? They probably find themselves out of the league and the coaches who can't relate to their players well, they don't have as much success either. Absolutely. You know, Jason, the reason I'm a partner at Taleo is because this face doesn't know how to bullshit. 
Like you can read on my face when I'm mad and you can read on my face when I'm happy, but no matter what, you're always going to know that I'm being honest with you. And I think, um, companies hire me to, to have those tough conversations. Companies ask me to come in and tell them the truth. Um, and then companies sometimes fire me because they can't handle the truth. You know, like it's, 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 it's real and it's, and I'm okay with it because at least I know that I show up every day, uh, the way I'm supposed to show up. Now, have you learned though, there's, you, you have to sometimes give the truthful message, but present it in a different way to a different company? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah I think, I think, uh, the way you present your message so it can be heard properly is the most important, but not sharing the message is something I'll never do. Yeah, yeah. that's fair. Yeah. Right. Um, Jason, oh, sorry, Ed, go I, ahead. I think, you know, you, you really, both of you, I think you've hit on an important thing and, uh, it, it reminded, there was a wonderful book. It was very short for the people listening by Harry Frankfurt, who is a philosopher. And he wrote a book called On Bullshit. And he mm -hmm. said, bullshitting is actually more dangerous than lying because liars know when they're lying and they can recognize that. But the danger of bullshit is that bullshitters are more in, uh, concerned about the impression that they're always right. The truth, the reality doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it, it's about me. And I think that's what what you know we've been talking about the last uh, you know period of time. And, and that's read that dangerous. book, Ed. I like yeah, it. On yeah, bullshit is it called? On bullshit. All right. By Harry like Frank. It. Very short, but it gets right to the point. And again, the danger is again these people who are they're professional bullshitters. It's about the impression that they are always right, and it's not about truth or anything else. So it's an interesting one, and I think uh, we see the dangers of that and certainly teams, organizations, and, and, and society, so. Yeah, politics. Yep. Jason, before we finish this off, um, I just, uh, um, I, I want to figure out from your perspective what you believe your best gift is and uh, tell us how you water it on a regular basis so it doesn't, doesn't go stale. Ooh, my best gift, wow. Um, I think I have natural empathy for people. And um, I, I, I water it by, I like helping others. Um, I, I started my own foundation, the, the Gregor Foundation, and, and uh, kind of in honor of my late father. And uh, we provide suits and, and shirts and ties and shoes for, for high school grads who can't afford it. And seeing those kids every, I almost tear up every time when I see them. They come out of the, the change room the first time they stand in front of the mirror with the suit on, like they stand an inch taller. And that's, that's a real big, I think I get as much out of that. I raise all the money myself for my foundation. And, you know, and these boys get to keep their suits and sometimes girls too. There's a few girls that, have, uh, that we've had in the program, which is awesome. Um, I like to do a lot of charitable stuff on my show. Uh, I like helping out to other people. And I, and I find that most people genuinely, especially in, in Alberta where my show, most my audience is in, in Edmonton area, a lot of people want to give and they want to help out and, and they feel good about themselves. And so uh, I, I like to have empathy. I like to be aware uh, of others and, and I try to help them out because uh, I, I was I was born into the one of the, the luckiest situations. A, I was born in Canada which is one of the best countries in the world to live in. When you when, like, we can complain all we want about political landscape, but at the end of the day, you know, we have lots of freedom. We're allowed to express our opinions. Um, I, I was born into a loving household and I don't re I didn't realize that until I was older as an adult, how much of a benefit that is when you just, you have love in your house. It gives you confidence and the ability to fail and know that someone's there more than you ever know until you're older. And so, uh, but for me, I think empathy is my, is my biggest thing. People tell me about it all the time. And I think it's something for me that I, I try to water it just by doing little things every day. Um, you know, volunteering, coaching, you know, helping out others that, that fills my bucket. It's, it's a little, it's a child book, a children's book that we have, uh, how to fill your bucket. And it, and it talks about, you know, you want to fill other people's buckets and at the same time you fill your own. So I think that's what I do. Well, uh, um, being somebody that's watched these things happen, uh, you absolutely do take care of your community and all of those around you. So thank you for how you contribute uh, to society. It's greatly appreciated. Ed, Jason is also from a farm like I am, and our first guest was from a farm. So you're getting the theme, Ed. You're probably going to have to move to a farm in order to be truly successful in life. I, I worked at, at New York. I worked in NASA. I've worked with a lot of animals. 
uh, my whole uh, career. So it's, uh, I, I feel connected. I was going to say that I was so impressed. Uh, we got interested in the discussion on sports and society, but, but your philanthropy, I love the fact that you talked about empathy uh, because I was hoping we get a little bit of chance to talk about some of the communities you're involved in. Uh, I have a, a sister-in-law who uh, faces MS. I know you're supportive of the MS bike tour. You're involved in Alzheimer's, the Christmas Bureau. You talk about your own foundation. And I think um, I know that when people are involved in helping other people, that is probably the thing that elevates more than anything else. Uh, I think a sense of satisfaction, well-being, good health is giving to others. And you obviously do that. And so uh, I wish we had a little more time to get into some of those those causes. But uh, it's, it's an honor just to have met you through through this and through Laurel and what you're doing and that connection to empathy really is what stands out for me. And your earlier message of your mom's curiosity, I think is another theme that came through. So, so I thank you for, for talking with us. Well, Ed Laurel, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yes, it was great, Jason. Um, and we look forward to having you back sometime in the future. Absolutely. Yeah. Anytime. So when we look at the, the mission as we're trying to drive this out to figure out how we're going to show up a little bit better every single day, a big part of what I'm taking away um, for this is, is actually making sure that my empathy is in check. At times, uh, I have to go into an organization and have a tough job of, of cleaning up some messes or, or, or challenging people to behave differently. And, and I would like to believe that my empathy is, is on point but I don't know that I'm watering it nearly enough to make sure that it's there in all situations. And I think it needs to show up all of the time. So that's, uh, that's my challenge out right now, Ed. Well, how about yourself? I, you know, I, I would say I think you're very empathic. One of the things I uh, connected with you on is I think you're, you're a no bullshitter, which I like. You're very straight. You're talented. You're smart. Uh, but I think also there's a large part of you that's always there about you care. Uh, things that have brought us together, I've always seen that. And so I think that's that's what stands out to me in the conversation today. There's that mixture of concern for people, uh, the ability to feel what others are dealing with in an honest way, that empathy, but also that other aspect of it, that curiosity. We've heard it from today. We heard it from previous speaks about the importance of that, being able to seek. And I think that that's a natural antidote against bullshitting. Because if you're genuinely curious, you're seeking, we're learning, you know that there's more out there. And, uh, you know, and not to compliment you. I don't want to compliment you, Laurel, but I think that's part of what you do. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think you, you naturally do that. So, Well, uh, Ed, thank you for that. I appreciate it. And, and I, so I guess what we're saying is if we can get some, some curiosity bug spray, it will get rid of all the bullshit that shows up. Yeah. So maybe, uh, maybe we'll just challenge everybody to be a little bit more curious because it, it, uh, it yeah. might actually improve your day, let alone your career. Yeah, absolutely. Curiosity leads to learning, leads to not. If, if you feel you need to learn, then you're not a bullshitter, right? So I think that, that ties together nicely. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, thank you again, Jason. Thank you, Ed. Really looking forward to, uh, to hearing more about about the no bullshit book that I'm going to actually read after this. Yeah. And I'm now tr following you, Jason, on uh, Twitter and uh, I've asked to follow you on Facebook. So I'll be, I'll be watching and looking to connect there. Awesome. Wonderful. Thanks everyone. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to the mission driven leader podcast presented by TaleoConnects.com. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast and leave a review wherever you listen to the show. Production of the podcast is by At Heart Creative and can be found at atheartcreative.com.